to welcome Margaret Critcher, who um, taught anthropology uh, of space and place at very appropriate at York University uh, in, for 25 years before retiring to Vancouver Island and co-founding the first senior co-housing community in Western Canada, Harborside Co-housing. And she's lived there ever since it opened in 2016. And she shared with us the link for a wonderful uh, video that I sent to people, which uh, is, is even very persuasive. So welcome, Margaret. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sneja. I'm going to start by, uh, it's a treat to be with you all today. I'm really, really pleased to be able to talk about my favorite subject. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And um, this is the title I ended up with for today, um, which is uh, Walking the Talk. Uh, because much of my experience was going from a bit position that I think all of you were in, of being a retired university professor, studying things and talking about things, to creating uh, my own co-housing community with other people. So uh, it was, uh, I got tired of talking about this and just wanted to do it. And uh, so this is the opportunity, and I think you have a great opportunity at, with and at UBC to do something similar. So that's the focus of my talk today is what does it take? And um, I'm going to take you back to one of Renee Matthews' slides from the last session that you had and, uh, and just say that the... Uh, this was, I think, about her third slide. And what I'm going to focus on today is this, the points in this orange box that your group, if you would choose to form one, and I think you're at a great moment to make a decision about that. You go forward or you don't go forward. You've had all these good talks this year, and you could do another year of talks, or you could move on to potlucks. Many, many groups do. And Christina will know this from the Langley experience. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're willing to do these four steps that are in the box, then you can actually create a co-housing community that you can be proud to live in. And that it demonstrates, I think in a, in a very um, academic way, it demonstrates how you can walk your talk uh, and live according to the values of co-housing and create a great retirement environment for yourself. So, but it does take these four things, um, a really clear, concrete, shared objective that it would be some sort of mandate or mission, what you're gonna do. You're gonna create retirement oriented housing uh, for women or for everybody, you know, it's up to you. Um, it takes a willingness to, to let go of the individualism that is so rampant in this society. Uh, and to think about what's in the best interest of the group and a realistic perspective on what is possible. Uh, and that relates to what kind of people you will include, how much, how exclusive you will be, how inclusive you will be. And perhaps most, well, it's, it's as important as these other things really, is knowing when to engage experienced professionals. Because part of Harborside's success was uh, engaging Renee and a, a, someone to do a feasibility study and an architect pretty early on in the process, which meant spending a little bit of money, not a lot at that time, to see if this was a feasible project. And the projects that get in trouble don't do the feasibility part. They just say, oh, I think we can do this. We don't need professionals. And, uh, you know, we, we see so many some people say nine out of 10 projects don't succeed. Others say, you know, I think my research suggests about five out of, uh, five out of 10 don't succeed, about 50%. Uh, I gotta click this thing. And this is the other slide of Renee's that I wanted to uh, emphasize for you. She, if you, and I want you to look back at her presentation after this, and I'll say that again at the end, because this was the, uh, the getting started was one of the key slides for her. And in that, identifying a core group, that's without that, you've got nothing, right? Otherwise, it's a developer-led project. So if you want it to be co-housing, you need to be front and center. You don't need to know anything about how to do it, uh, except that you want it to happen and you're willing to learn and you're willing to put time and money into it. Uh, I knew nothing about co-housing when I started creating Harborside, except what I had taught about it. So it was all the book learning, and you, you all have plenty of that, right? We all do. 
Uh, and uh, that was enough to let me start teaching about it because I'd already been teaching about it, right? Uh, and then to uh, actually begin to experience, experientially learn about it. So this is what, I, what we ended up creating. This is Harborside Co-housing, it's in Souk, BC. It, uh, as Sneja said, it was completed in 2016, early in 2016. It in, it, this is the um, site plan on the left here. It has uh, three fourplexes. This one, this one, two, and six are fourplexes and three duplexes, uh, numbers three, four, and five. And then it has a three-story apartment building, seven, uh, which is connected and has a shared elevator with this uh, common house over here in yellow, which was a resort building on the site. And that common house shows here as this small looking, um, but uh, 3000 square foot building at the back of the property. The building, the site was uh, laid out uh, by our architect, Peter Troyheit, who's done many co-housing projects um, at, in order that everybody could have a view because in our, our, um, the principles we agreed upon and the mandate that we agreed upon, having a view was really important. I guess it's probably not in the mandate. It's just, it was really important to everybody. Um, so everybody has a view. Uh, some views are better than others, but everybody has a south facing waterfront view. And we had the synergy of 31 households uh, so that none of us could have afforded waterfront property, except that we could together. And we could do it by going small in our unit design. So the units are very compact. You can see at the bottom, um, th this uh, view through one of the medium sized units, and it's not big. That's the living area. There's one, there's two small bedrooms in that, in that uh, unit. But who needs big when you've got that, right? Um, is there anything else I needed to say there? I don't think so. There are about 44 of us living there. It is senior focused, but not age restricted. You, you have the choice, although given recent, legis, re, recent um, changes in BC, there, it's not possible to restrict uh, access to rental housing as the way it used to be, uh, or to ownership. So um, you can restrict for age. I don't know about restricting for gender. You probably can, I don't know. Um, but we, we decided not to restrict it because we wanted people to be able to come with their adult children. Um, and, and we do, we had a um, dependent daughter who was in her 40s living with her family when we first started. She was in a wheelchair, which helped us to learn a lot about accessibility. Um, and then we've had people come. We recently had a young family related to somebody else in the community with a three-year-old, which was really lovely. Uh, but we are mainly in our 60s and 70s, with some in, in the 80s and two in their 90s. And we believe that we can flourish in co-housing much longer than we could in a private home because we have the support, we have the design benefits. Our units are all laid out to be fully accessible once you, whatever that means. Once you get in the door, I know that doesn't serve everybody but the wide doorways, uh, big bathrooms, so you could easily transfer from a wheelchair to the toilet or the bathtub um, and so on. But some of the units have steps. So you can imagine the fourplexes at the bottom of the property, like down here, uh, you've got a full flight of stairs to get up to these units. But the belief is that uh, we'll do the stairs as long as we can. And then we've already had one household move up to a unit in the common house when the stairs were too much for them in the a unit near the common house in the apartment building. So this started for me in 2011, um, actually about just before Christmas 2010, when I was talking to my friend Gail, who's married to the fellow on the right, Andrew Moore. Uh, and we were both putting our mothers in care facilities. And we realized that we didn't want what we were giving our mothers and we couldn't afford it, the really nice ones. Um, and so what were, you know, what was ahead for us? Uh, I was in my sixties at that time. Uh, and uh, I thought, oh, this is the time when I still have lots of energy to figure out a better way to age in place. So we had just 
um, gotten a copy of Charles Tourette's book called The Senior Co-Housing Handbook, which is an excellent reference. And we were bold enough to think that we could do this ourselves. You read that book, it's step by step. Go ahead, just do it, right? I rapidly learned that we needed professional help right almost from the beginning. Um, and so uh, Andrew and I went to Nevada City, which is uh, the co-housing that Charles Durrett lives in, in um, California. And we did a week-long training with him in the basics of co-housing and in how to teach his study group one, he calls it, which is described in his book. And it was to prepare, to help people decide if senior focused co-housing was for them. So Andrew is an uh, architect uh, and he works with um, indigenous people in our town uh, and creating senior focused housing for indigenous uh, communities. And I had freshly retired from York University and we decided we would offer Chuck's course, and we, which was this 10 week aging course. And we did it twice in 2012 and decided we couldn't sustain it because it was 10 weeks, right? You can't put your life on hold for that sort of thing when you're retired. So um, we got permission from Chuck to uh, rewrite the curriculum. And I did that. Uh, we reduced it to a weekend long in-person uh, course. Uh, and then over the, and we used it to build Harborside. That's, that's exactly how uh, the, the, the initial group came to be. We, re we, as Harborside took shape, we required that people take this course in order to become pre-equity members of the group. Uh, when COVID hit, I, I adapted the same sort of format in my subsequent work with other um, new co-housing communities. And I taught a course called Is Co-Housing for You for Ravens Crossing and West Wind Harbor, the two new communities on the island uh, when I was working with CDC. And those went on Zoom, of course, during COVID. And it worked well enough. So I think that if you feel like teaching again after you retire, which you may certainly not, um, that it's a great way to build the group. And it really supported people to decide for themselves if they wanted to accept the invitation that co-housing offers. Uh, we, this is the way we got a partnership with Royal Roads University to offer the course beginning in 2013. And that worked out really well because they handled the registration and the payment of fees and all of the promotion. Um, so we offered it many times. I'm not really sure how many times we did it. It was three or four times a year um, until we had a household for every one of the Harborside 31 units. Uh, and we had that in place by the fall of 2014, which was when we began construction. How did we build um, the community of Harborside? We did it with this course. We did it with the community building that happened through the course. It's amazing how connected people became. <coughs> Excuse me. And they learned um, that you didn't have to be friends with people at the outset to become friends with them and through shared interests in, in living in community. Because over the course of a two-day weekend, um, they, they really had a great experience. Um, and you've taken this course, Christina, I know. So. Yes, yes, I can certainly back what Margaret's saying. Yeah, it's, it's uncanny how connected people get. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially in person, but even on the Zoom versions of these courses. So, and it, it also supports people to know what they're getting into so that they don't arrive and experience disappointment or think that it was going to be something different. And it can go in both directions. Like, oh, I wanted more of an intentional community than this. I wanted us to share more values than just around housing. Or it can be, um, I, I this is too much for me. You're all, you know, too connected, and I don't like consensus decision making that way. I don't want to take everybody's opinion into account. Uh, I, I want to have my own way. So there's a lot of things that we learned along the way by the course by having lots of potlucks, by putting our money in together. And so it's not just walking the talk, but, but putting your money where your mouth is to take a risk 
And the money in the early stages of any co-housing project is totally at risk, meaning you might not get anything for, well, you'll get a, a professional services, but they might, for example, do a um, feasibility study and tell you this site is not gonna work for you because there's not enough water uh, in a rural area to support it, or the zoning is not going to support it. You can get rezoning, we did for Harborside, but you need to know what's actually feasible and you have to pay for that. So that's money at risk. And uh, so the key is to build a core group that is sufficiently committed to say, making co-housing happen as part of the UBC village, uh, that they're willing to put a little bit of money into it. We were not um, able to get funding from anybody except a seed grant from CMHC for $10,000 and two um, CMHC interest-free loans for a total, I think, of $60,000. The seed money was great. It was the perfect kickstart for our project, and CMHC was very supportive. Um, but the loans we didn't end up really needing because our members were investing in the project and using the process that Renee described last week. So we were beyond being that frail when we had the CMHC loans. We had lots of social events. Um, we had a big dance party at some point in our com the common house that we ended up buying, the resort that we ended up buying. We did uh, field trips, and I highly recommend that. Just you're so well located uh, in the Vancouver Lower Mainland area. Go and see Windsong out in Langley. Um, go and see Cranberry Commons out in Burnaby and Vancouver co-housing and Little Mountain co-housing and Driftwood and Keyside. And I've probably forgotten some. There's just a lot. They're all different. And uh, with different architects, and they're old, you know, some are Keysides more than 20 years old, and Cranberry is 20 years old. No, maybe it's the other way around. But there, there are some that are very established, and then some that opened last year, like Little Mountain and Driftwood. So I would say, and field trips are fun, and they're great community builders. So you can coalesce a core group by just saying, let's go see what's out there, and let's have lunch and talk about what do we want, what values do we want in this. What can we agree upon? Is it a feminist oriented co-housing project, for example? Uh, so that's perfectly possible. And the broader your focus, like we just wanna create co-housing at UBC, um, the more easy it will be for you to build a group. You can invite them in and there's, there's very few restrictions. So, uh, you know, we found that um, there were some people who wouldn't join us unless we dealt with electromagnetic frequency issues, like no Wi-Fi, uh, no smart meters at that time. That was still a choice, not anymore. Um, and, uh, and so there, we really couldn't, we weren't willing to accommodate that. It helped us to clarify our values, but we had big discussions about it. And living on the island, we had an equally big discussion about can everybody have a wood stove? because there were people who were so devoted to their wood burning stoves, right? And then they went off and researched it and they came back with a recommendation that no, we can't because uh, we, we can't manage the smoke from 31 wood stoves or the wood storage or the mess. So you learn through that process of, of the group really building itself and it takes some leadership. Uh, and there, was a, a, there were just a few of us at Harborside and, it was me and Andrew initially, and Andrew didn't, and Gail did not end up moving in. They left, in fact, when they had to put money down to buy the property. Um, so they're still big supporters of Harborside, but they're not living in it. So you'll, you'll find your people. That's all I'm saying. Um, we did, uh, in addition to the parties and the potlucks and the tours and the course, we did quite a lot of skills building. So this is a communication training from um, a uh, facilitator from the Haven Institute, which is a center for personal growth and development on Gabriola Island. Uh, and uh, he taught us a lot about how to work out conflict. So we were walking the Haven communication model in this, in this workshop. Um, and, it, and he made it fun, as you can see. And uh, it was very good for building our capacity to work together by consensus. 
and to get our own, as I said at the outset, individualism out of there. Um, we also created a, a website, um, a senior co-housing website, Canadian senior co-housing website, which no longer exists. The information from it is on the cohousing.ca website, uh, Canadian Co-Housing Network. Uh, and then as we began to, when we had like, I don't know, eight, 12, 15 people who were interested enough to put some money in to bring uh, Renee Matthew over. We'd gone on a field trip to Cranberry and met her there. And she gave us an hour of her time and we were really impressed. And uh, we had brought her over to, Harvest, to the site that became Harborside to give a getting it built workshop, how to get your community built. And uh, in that process, we bonded with each other so much and began to be ready to start to look for a site. You need to have the group before you get the site, otherwise it's very hard to transfer. If there's one person uh, who owns the site, it's really hard to transfer control to it. But if you have a site that you can negotiate with UBC, then you know that's another possibility. It's like, we can do this. Um, but then the dance will be how committed, what kind of commitment can you get out of them? Um, then we got free, we never paid for advertising from anybody. Uh, we did get lots of free publicity. So this is a woman from Shaw TV um, doing a uh, feature on uh, Harborside and also Kitty El Elton, who is the founder. She played the role that I played, the volunteer um, spark for Westman Harbor Co-housing. And so we have a media page at Harborside like this. Uh, this is our private website that um, uh, Renee created for us, that is full of stuff that you can't, it's priceless, right? <clears throat> so I'll start at the bottom. Um, we, uh, we, we got the coverage from Shaw TV. We wrote, um, Andrew and I both wrote articles for Communities Magazine and just sent them in over the transom and got them published. Uh, the same with Good Times Magazine. One of our members was Scottish and he wrote something for the Scottish Review and they published it our local newspaper, the Souk News Mirror. Um, we got radio coverage, so we sought that out. Uh, we emailed CBC Radio and we got on their show. And um, it, it's a, it's, it's, we did seek advertising in that sense. And then even the social sciences directory, I can't remember exactly what that was, and more community magazine. The best break we got was from radio, um, uh, uh, regular radio on CBC. We got on the Sunday edition in 2015. Uh, with a, a documentary from Karen Wells that you can listen to by clicking on this. She is so brilliant. Um, and that touches, people just piled into the group at that point. The Globe and Mail was also really helpful. Uh, and, you know, now I know how to access these people. Um, a Radio Canada, not to be outdone by CBC, regular English CBC, came out with a team uh, in, uh, just, just after we opened um, in 2016. And uh, CMHC not only invited me to give talks, they gave us some publicity as well. And then more recently, Zoomer. And I, there are others since I haven't updated this. So I think that gives you a sense of um, you know, what, what you can do. Um, we, um, uh, we grew the group quite quickly. And uh, by the time we'd had the Getting It Built workshop, it was less than a year before we had secured the property uh, that we eventually moved into. And so I hope that this will inspire you to, um, to, do, to try something. What have you got to lose, really? Um, lots of time and money. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, but uh, it certainly has worked out well for us. And, uh, and I love bringing what I've learned to, uh, to new projects, as well as to my lovely, lovely home community. I often end these talks by saying I wouldn't want to live anywhere else, and that's absolutely true. So I'd be happy to take your questions. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Margaret. That's been great. Um, well, this is the moment. Um, people have their questions already. Well, one of the questions, do we, yeah, 
are there hands? I'm looking for hands, but uh, you know, you can, yes, Nicola, good. Well, well, I was just going to go back to the CMHC uh, question. You said you did get a loan from CMHC, a, mm -hmm. an interest-free loan, mm -hmm. which is quite something these days. Um, is that still available, do you know? I believe it is, it's called seed funding. Okay. Uh, you have to be creating affordable housing to do it. And we okay. did create uh, initially two um, below market homes that we ended up putting a, a, re a restriction, a covenant on the, our municipality wouldn't, but, uh, but we did that. Uh, only one of them actually became an affordable housing home. We couldn't find somebody to take the other one. Um, it, so, it, you know, it depends on your agreements and what the market is and, and so on. But CMHC was very supportive of us in principle. Um, but they certainly, you know, we were not deep affordability. And that was one of the things that I um, learned in this process, Nicola, was that uh, it's easy to think that co-housing is below market. And my colleague, Andrew, believed that he could, they could sell their home uh, in the country outside Souk and sell it for enough that they could buy a condo at Harborside, much smaller, obviously, than their family home, and that they'd have money left over with which to travel um, and do fun things in their retirement. But that was not true. We ended up paying most of us as much for our condos at Harborside with ample common space as we got for the homes that we sold the much larger homes that we sold. So that's just a reality right now. Um, and, and it all worked out. And those homes have, for better and worse, increased in value hugely over the eight years that we've lived there. So it's yeah. the same as the rest of the housing market. It's exactly the same as what a condo would cost you in you know, Burnaby is what a co-housing costs you in Burnaby. Yeah, so that that's the, the thing about I mean, the old idea of co-ops was that some the richer people supported the poorer people, but yes. co-housing is not that model, is it? Well, in the sense it is, Nicola, because it's not the, in the sense that some units are more, people may pay more for, for their housing charges. That's the no. co-op model, right. uh, where there's a housing charge, but you get a reduction in, in, through a subsidy if you qualify in terms of income. And you don't own it, you're renting it. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're actually not renting it, you own a share. Yeah. Uh, but you know the model. Um, the affordability in co-housing comes from some people having more equity to be able to put into the project than others. And they help to make it possible during the development to include people who can just barely afford the unit at the end of the day. Right. So for those people, the whole project keeps the lid on the budget. And that's where we think about each other rather than our individual needs, right? So we included optional upgrades, for example, for finishings and cabinetry that were uh, available that, that people with more affluence went for and others chose not to or simply couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. That's where the, the spread was. But if without those people with deep pockets who and lots of confidence in the project who invested and they got a return on their investment, they got a certain rate of return on the investment, um, then project couldn't have succeeded. So some of the, for example, I paid in full for my home a year or more before I moved into it to support the project. And I got a financial reward for it. And th there seems to be a lot of happiness in the co-housing group about how we did that. Uh, and we still work well with income differences and wealth differences. But so that's where the affordability comes. We have people there who can barely afford to, you know, to pay for the unit and pay the strata fees, which are $450 a month. Uh, so it's it's not deep affordability, no. But, but that satisfies there, CMHC. I mean, it uh, satisfies the CMHC. Um, seed funding. Or, yeah, the seed funding, right. Yeah. Yeah, it was okay. enough for that, but it wasn't, wasn't enough to get any more than that. Right. The seed funding was really to do a, we used it to do a um, um, housing need and demand analysis at Souk, which was required, um, really the project needed to have that done. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you find ways and you, there's no reason why if you are community led housing, you cannot create, um, I'm going to turn that around. 
as a community-led housing project, you can create deep affordability. It's all in what you agree to and how you approach the project. Mm -hmm. So it might not be co-housing like Harborside, but it can be something different. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be a rental project, but you can do it. If it's community-led housing, simply meaning that a group has, a, a, has, a, has agreed upon the values and the uh, structure of their project, who's in it, who or who can't be in it, really, I guess, uh, and uh, and uh, like any age restrictions or something like that, um, and what your values are. Is it about aging in place? Is it about playing music? I mean, you had a presenter from the arts community, right? You can focus on that. But what's your clear? And is it uh, going to be an apartment building or is it going to be single family dwellings like Roberts Creek on the Sunshine Coast? Um, mm -hmm. Is it going to be like Harborside with a mix of different uh, building designs for a purpose, namely the view um, that didn't doesn't serve senior housing well at all, I must say, because we have this huge hill. You should come and have a tour. We give a tour on the fourth Saturday of every month. Um, but it's really a, a workout after my hip replacement to go up and down, up that hill mainly. Um, so pick your site according to your values too. But that's where it starts with all of you is, you know, are you the group that's going to be proud to look back in four years and say, we did this? Like the banner that we began with, right? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity and it's, it's a challenge and a lot of work. Any other questions? Yes. Isabel. Uh, you're muted. Unmute. Unmute. Okay. Yep. Unmute. You're still muted. Uh, you're still muted, Isabel. Um, on the bottom of your screen. No, no. On the bottom of your screen, you have to click the microphone. Um, we can't hear you. Uh, Can you unmute her? Um, I'm trying. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, oh, there we go. I sent her a I was looking for me up at the top there. No, no. Stop. <laughs> um, have you had any people move out or if you anticipate anyone moving out, how will, will you, um, I don't know how to, will you select people or will it be self-selection? I mean, what, what if someone wants to move in that doesn't really fit your idea of, um, you know, your community member? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what if there's somebody who's a bad fit for the community? Um, in co-ops, in a co-op legal structure, the rental co-op model that we're all familiar with from False Creek in that area, um, you perform site, you perform tenant selection interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the, in, in the book that I wrote about co-ops, we, we quoted these amazing um, reports about the people, members of the co-op going in uh, during the forming stage and interviewing other members in their homes. And I remember somebody saying, oh, she wasn't suited for the co-op because she couldn't even form community with her cat. <laughs> Uh, so I followed that very closely, um, and I must say I can't see that they did any better job than we do just in a strata where it's on the open market and anybody can buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, during the development process, we did it um, by self-selection, but we gave people so much information about what we thought they were getting into, and they got to know each other. So they got to know their neighbors before they decided if they were going to move in. So that was, um, there was a lot of desire to, to retain that process, but you can't do it under the Strata Act. So we hope for the best, and we have had quite a lot of turnover. Um, nobody left for the first year, I thought, oh, fine. And then the second year, I think it was four households left. So we've had almost half of, no, 12 out of the 31 have sold. A couple of them have sold more than once. Um, and sometimes they've sold because people moved in who didn't really know what they were getting into and they, they weren't ready for it. They wanted their private home back. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they sold for uh, other reasons that happened to all of us, you know, illness or 
um, family reasons, those sorts of things. I mean, we're a very mobile society in Canada right now. Um, but uh, so there's still quite a strong core founding group at Harborside, but I was surprised by the turnover and it happens in all the co-housings these days. Um, there really is just, just like anything else, which means that there's an opportunity for people to buy in or to rent. We allow rentals at Harborside too. And that's another way of creating affordable housing. You own it, but you're not living in it right now, or you're not living in it for six months of the year. Mm -hmm. And people move around. So there's some people in co-housing who started in one unit renting, and then the owner wants to move in. And so they met rent from somebody else in the same co-housing community. And then I, I know of a, of a household that's done that three times. And the Danish communities also accommodate this. So you can move around within, there's a network. And so it's very hard for outsiders right now to buy into Harborside because there's just, the units go so quickly. The last ones have gone like in 24 hours without <laughs> realtors. Um, so, but they've sold to people who already were renting in the community. Uh, so, or owned another home in the community. So um, there's lots of possibilities for creating affordability within the turnover. And the turnover, uh, you know, I had to kind of dust myself off with the first move outs. Uh, I was like, where did we go wrong? Why don't you love us? But I've realized that it's just circumstance and it isn't for everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just a household thing. Um, if you go to the top right hand corner of the screen, you can adjust whether you're gallery or, you know, you see everyone. You, if you adjust the gallery, you can see everyone. Mm -hmm. and I'm happy that I can see everyone. Yes. Other questions? A question that's come up in the course of these talks has been in relation to transitions. You said you, quite amazingly, you've got people who um, are in their 90s too. Um, at a certain point, you know, there are um, needs, medical needs. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering to what extent is there, um, I don't know, awareness of, accommodation of? Oh, yeah. Happening? Yeah. Yes, Nisha, thank you. That's usually something I put in a talk, but um, it, we have a very strong program of co-care or community care. That is, I mean, many communities have a, a well-being committee or a heart circle or that sort of thing, but ours is focused on uh, issues that arise as we get older. So we have a suite in our common house that we call our co-care suite, and it's dedicated to looking after members of the community who um, need a caregiver to come in. We haven't actually had to use it for that purpose yet. Caregivers actually turn out they want to sleep at home. They don't wanna be in the living in the community of people they're supporting. At least that's been our experience. But um, it's been very helpful for families to come in. Uh, it's got a full kitchen. Um, it's very close to a shared laundry. And um, it's the families can come in and spend weeks keeping company with somebody who needs them. Uh, either through loss or illness or any reason at all. Um, and during COVID, we used that. That was the suite that could be used by guests who were unvaccinated. It was a way we navigated that issue. Whereas the, we have two other guest rooms in our common house with private baths. It was a resort, right? Um, and uh, those are available to, were available to vaccinated guests and are still are available to just your ordinary guests, right? They're queen size bed in a bathroom. And we don't charge for those, but people are encouraged to make donations. So that's how we live in such compact units. So average unit size in our place is 882 square feet. Um, the largest one, I have the privilege of living in one of the five like it, is 960 square feet. So there's not a lot of range in the sizes. Um, we also are actively educating ourselves about uh, the, the medical uh, concerns that come up. So how to get Meals on re Wheels. We have a, a web page that's been growing recently a lot. What are the resources available to us in our town? Uh, the end of life preparation. So we have somebody coming in. We had a doctor, she still lives with us, who gave us training in um, end of life preparation and the My Last Wishes document that we should all sign and keep with our family doctors. Um, and with our, I suppose, our lawyers. 
Um, and now we're having somebody else come in to do that. We're having an occupational therapist come in to look again at our community common spaces um, to see what else we need. Where do we need a grab bar that we don't have it? One of our 90 year olds still goes um, down to the waterfront every day in her walker and back up. Um, and another one is uh, on her living on her own. She doesn't even use a walker uh, and she still goes to yoga class uh, up in Souk, up in the main part of town. We're about 10 minutes, but there is a hill. Uh, the town of Souk is, is 10 minutes uphill with all the shops and banks and doctor's offices and restaurants and that sort of thing. Um, but this second 90-year-old has the support from her daughter and husband, a daughter's husband, who live at Harborside and were founding members. And then when the daughter and husband go, went on holiday this winter, then one of, the, one of their children came and stayed on the property to keep an eye on, on the mom. So there's a lot of mutual support. We cook meals for each other. We have a formal uh, rotation of a meal train when somebody's had surgery, if that's what they want. We're always consulting with each other to see what is it that you need? How can we support you? Um, and sometimes somebody will say, just somebody said this to me the other day, all you have to do is come drop by here every other day and have a chat with me, right? We stay connected uh, because, because we see each other all the time. And that's the biggest difference with private living in a private home, where when you're really old, you're only going to see your caregiver. Yeah. Yeah. Sharon. Um, are you, you're muted. I think we can't hear you for some reason. Oh. Okay. Uh, I can't see her either. Oh, maybe I can. If, I... if you go to the gallery, you should yeah. be able to see her. Um, hang on. She's gone now. Oh, there you are. Not muted. Uh, there's Sharon. Yeah. Yeah. I, why are we not hearing you? Um, uh, she's not muted, so it must be a microphone. Sharon, could why you type your question in the issue? chat? Yeah, it must be a computer issue. Yeah. Seems to be a computer. Sharon. And it could be the computer, her sound isn't loud enough. Oh, now it's... Now, now, you're muted. now you're the muted is up. Try and unmute and see if... Hmm. No, sorry. <laughs> oh, darn. Um, Sharon, well, at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat. Um, if you uh, hover on the bottom of your screen, maybe it you says, can It says that she's unmuted now. Right, but we can't is, hear it that before. Turn Sometimes up. you log off and log back on. I know. It works if it's I'm your sorry computer. For that. Well, and at the very top of your screen, Sharon, there's a little microphone with, uh, and if you click on that, you can see it might be very low and not making much sound. Okay, so can you say something about the common areas? Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, we have about... 4,500 feet, I think it is, of common space. Um, West Wind Harbor has about 7,000 square feet of common space. They also bought an existing house uh, that serves, provides a lot of their common space. And then they also have a roof deck, which we don't have. Um, we have the common house with its guest rooms, a beautiful entertainment space. And you can see these pictures on our public website. If you look at available homes, and there's a button there for living at Harborside. Um, we have a lower level to that common house that contains a social room with a big screen um, for project. It doesn't have TV, but it has uh, Netflix and the ability to project anything on it. Uh, we have an office in that building. We have a kitchen upstairs in the main floor of the common house and also a lower kitchen, which is the messy kitchen where we do canning and pie baking and cook crabs because we're on the waterfront. Um, and then we have the co-care suite in that building. We have bike storage and storage for each. Each unit has a personal storage unit. We have parking for one car per household. Um, we have, as, as a bonus, we got uh, during construction, because of a construction problem, really, the contractor said, you know, you could build two uh, rooms here for your common space. So we built a gym and a art room. And they're south facing, looking over the water. It's the most beautiful gym and art room I've ever seen. 
Uh, we have a wharf where members can keep their sailboats and kayaks and that sort of thing. We have a workshop which really settled the men down into our community. They were all anxious about what am I going to do in my retirement? And uh, that really helps. My husband was particularly edgy about that. Um, and he finds so many things to keep himself busy as well as having a little sailboat at the dock. Um, and one word I think it here would be good about aid uh, restricting in any way, like to women, which you can do, I think. You, certainly the co-ops can, if you're structured as a co-op, because there are several of these. But you'll build the group fastest by just seeing who shows up, by being clear that you want to build housing in which you can age in place, or whatever the driving value is, uh, or environmentally sound, or whatever. But being open to whoever shows up. Uh, and that helped us to sell out before we started construction. And, and anywhere that is more restrictive than that, it can be really difficult. Uh, we had challenges with uh, one of the projects that really wanted uh, multi-generational, they wanted young families, and they were in a market where the housing was so expensive in Sydney. Uh, and they ended up not getting the young families until after they'd moved in, and then uh, young families rented, rented back from them in a kind of, uh, that kind of arrangement. So it's kind of like trusting that uh, the right people will arrive uh, and you need to be clear about what you want. So if it's okay with you, I wondered if we could take the last 10, is it 10 minutes still to, for you all to talk about what do you see as your next steps? I mean, I can help you if you want to, you know, start down the path and most, and I can help you in a very gentle kind of way, because really you've got to do this thing. Um, and then, you know, working with CDC would support success for your group, 11 out of 11 so far. Uh, but you need to decide if you're ready to get out of the, uh, um, of the lecture stage, really. And you could do this for another year and probably learn lots uh, about uh, the process. Um, but this is a good time to look at what have you accomplished this year and what do you want to do? Um, part of the issue is, Margaret, that not everyone who's part of the group, it's a much larger group. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I was going to send out um, after this meeting, which comes to an official end of our talks for the time being, is to see whether people wanted to meet in person uh, in a few weeks time to actually come together and discuss precisely that, whether there are enough people there to form a core group and whether we want to go on because we've certainly had lots of pointers now, lots of uh, information about what the next steps are yes uh, and the question then is um are there enough of us a motley a motley group yeah uh, to see whether we want to pursue things because i think one thing that's very clear to all of us is that it is a lot of work of course it is uh, mm -hmm. a commitment of time and may well be financial commitments. So at this point, I think it's more about committing the time to see what the options are and what might work in the environment uh, that we were suggesting, the UBC environment. That's yeah. right. It will be your research time, really. Yeah. Um, so what, maybe someone else wants to come in here to, to ask some questions. Yes, Neve. Um, thank you, Margaret. I think that's very helpful. And and I really like your point about saying, see who shows up. Because, of course, one of the failings of this group is we're all academics. So we could think <laughs> this to death and do not yeah. get very far. So I, I really like that approach of sort of, you know, just sort of getting started and see who shows up with interest. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is the failing and the strength. It, 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 I think it's more of a strength than a failing, but uh, yes, it's so easy for us to just keep on studying and doing more research and maybe some writing and some talking. Um, but to walk the talk is challenging. Uh, you have to step off the edge of the cliff, you know, and hope that the magic shows up. Uh, and so you do it without a huge risk at the beginning. But that's how we started, is just what Sneja is proposing now, right? Is we just held an information meeting. We did it over the grocery store, uh, but you could probably do it in a much nicer setting. And we put a call out, not just to people we knew were interested, but we I think we put something out on, you know, billboards or on Facebook or something and just invited anybody who was interested in talking about it. 
And we got 30 people with very little notice. Uh, and they, there was enough. That's what sent me off to uh, California with Andrew to study with Chuck Durrett. And it went from there. And when was, once we'd done that, we came back and gave another information meeting and we got 50. And Chuck had said, well, if you hold a meeting and you get 50 people, you've got a project. <laughs> because most of the people who committed were not people I was friends with, really. I mean, the friends didn't come through in the end. Uh, so these were, some of them were acquaintances, many of them were people that I'd never met. But we bonded, boy, did we ever bond. There's nothing like putting your money and your time in with people over a few years. Um, so I think that's, that's the logical next step is you've been, uh, you've been meeting on Zoom, you can meet face to face, have some food, talk to each other, um, and just do a kind of, uh, what do we wanna do next? Good, thank you. Anyone else want to chime in? Well, I, I just just want to ask about age. Um, I mean, I, I'm 81, and so, um, and I'm already in a co-op, and and my feeling is, you know, it, this would take four or five years. By which time I'm going to be 86. Yeah. I, I maybe it's a little too late. I wish I wish this had happened 10 years ago um when I, I don't know how you how what you what your comment would be on that i know you've got older people living in your building but did they move in after it had all been done no they no they didn't i think that's harder nicola yeah. is to move into a place in your 80s right uh, where you don't know people maybe you don't the banking arrangements are different the doctor the doctor's a big thing um so it's starting one now is better than not starting one Mm -hmm. uh, sh the person who is, uh, has, a, has a daughter and son-in-law living at Harborside, she moved from Edmonton to Souk uh, in order to become part of the project. And she had to be in her 80s at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and she moved, you know, during the construction so she could get to know people. Uh, and we do have a staged membership so that you can, you could be an associate member for a while, which Renee explained last time. Uh, it's a it's sure it's it's a risk and you know it's uh you don't have to give up your co-op until it's done right right yeah so Alison, you Allison you've got to unmute we did have people who I, said I, I go ahead Allison no I just didn't want to interrupt Margaret um yeah. just in in terms of Nicola's point um i have a sort of secondhand acquaintance in the toronto area who they attempted to get um people to come on side and and they're i think they're i think they're probably in their 60s and men and they their concept was aging in place and many of the people they thought would just jump at the chance to do this said they weren't ready oh so, right um, that's sort of the opposite i mean yeah. i feel like i've been ready for a while mm -hmm. for something like this i i i mean i i remember one of oh, i don't remember her name but somebody in the architecture department ubc talking about the development what should happen at ubc in the lands and talking about places for seniors and I thought wow that's a really brilliant idea what you know so I feel like something I have thought about for quite a long time um and for me the, the for me personally the best way to really learn about how how this all could and will unfold is to actually do it so <laughs> good for definitely you definitely ready to sit around it table at a Chinese restaurant or find a place on campus that we can meet and bring some food or or just coffee or whatever yep yep or wine that works too wine's good too <laughs> yes you're absolutely right though that was such an obstacle for us and that's why the aging course that we taught was effective because it was to first was to get people out of denial that you know I'm not ready we had a slide of people with their heads in the sand from Australia, actually, uh, getting out of denial while you still have the energy to do this and the health and all of that and the money for that matter. 
so we tried to get people in their 50s and well, mostly in their 50s. And we pretty much did with a you know, few older people. It was a um, yeah, 50s and early 60s. And so they had, had lots of energy for this. And the hard thing was to get them to realize that this was a good time to do it. And so the doctor, who's the mother of our 95-year-old, or uh, maybe she's 94, uh, would give us uh, sort of pep talks on this. It's like, she said, I always, she was a family practitioner, I always see people come in here in their 50s with a big house that's going to be too much for them in a few years. And they say, I'm not ready to downsize. I'm not ready yet. And then she says, they come in, they say that for a few years, and then suddenly they're past ready and the house is too much or they are confined to it. And it's just, it's always too late. So we talk about being boiling frogs. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, you'll hear from me. I mean, I will send out a message and uh, I will add to our list some of the new people who aren't actually on the list yet. And you can decide whether or not uh, we can come together for a meeting um, to in person. Thank you, Margaret. Very inspiring. And uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you all. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thank okay. You. Nice so to see you again. Bye-bye. Nice to see you Bye. too. Bye. Bye.